Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to this virtual worship service of Indian Trail Presbyterian Church. My name is Stephen Ratliff, the pastor. We welcome you, however you have joined us, whether you're a longtime member of the church or uh, fairly new, or maybe just joined us uh, by virtue of these virtual worship services. Uh, we are all God's children, and we come to this place with the one thing in common, uh, that we have been called by God, created by God, cherished by God, forgiven by God, transformed by God for work in the kingdom. So welcome to this place. I want to start this morning with a word from, or for our young people, and really for, for all of us, uh, I want to talk a little bit about one easy way to do Bible study, and it's a way that, that I've used not just with young people, but also with adults. Um, and it's just a, a really simple way to enter into a devotional Bible study um, if we're not used to doing that, or if we want to just get started with that. And so uh, the last few weeks for in, in our time with our young people, we've been looking at um, a book of stories that are stories about stories in the Bible. They're not the, the exact stories from the Bible, but they take those stories in the Bible and sort of use imagination to, to think about um, stories around those stories. And uh, we talked about the last few weeks how those stories kind of encourage us to ask questions and wonder about what the story means. What is it trying to say to us? What does it mean for us uh, as people of faith? Well, that's not a new idea because Jesus did a lot of that. All uh, Often, Jesus' teaching was done through what we call parables. Stories that Jesus told, they weren't necessarily true stories, like factual stories, but they were stories that invited the hearer into um, a narrative uh, and that then invited the hearer to kind of wonder and ask questions. Well, what does this mean or what does that mean and, and what does that mean for me? What is Jesus trying to say to me in this story? And we still do that with Jesus' parables. So um, today I want to invite, introduce you to a real easy way of using the parables for Bible study. Now, most parables have several characters in them. This, the story I want to share with you today is one that one of Jesus' more popular parables. It's a story that we call the story of the Good Samaritan. And there are several characters in this story. There is a man who gets robbed and beaten. Uh, there are a priest and a Levite, two religious uh, people who um, had particular duties in the temple. And in fact, we might think about them like we think about our own pastors and elders in the church. They were um, people called to do the work of God. Uh, there is also a, a Samaritan who was not really... Um, liked by a lot of the good people of Jesus' day. Um, and there's an innkeeper. There are, of course, the robbers. But I would like for you to choose one of these characters um, to listen to this story as if you were that character, to put yourself into the story through the eyes of a particular character. It doesn't really matter which one you choose. Um, you can read it several times and be different characters. Uh, but choose one of those characters now, the, um, the priest of the Levite, the, uh, the man who was beaten, the Samaritan, the innkeeper. And I'm going to read the story as Jesus told it in Luke's gospel. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, 
And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. So you see, this story invites us to, to ask some questions. If we had chosen one of the characters, we might ask, well, wonder what that character was thinking, or why did that character do what they did? What, um, what is Jesus trying to tell us with this story? What if I change my perspective and read it from the perspective of another of the characters? Do I learn anything different? Does anything else come to my mind? I wonder what this story means for my life. So you see, whether we're young, old, have been in the church a long time, or brand new to the church, this is an easy way to, to enter into the, the story of the Bible. Um, to begin asking questions. Some of those questions we have may be really simple to, to Google and look up, like what is a Samaritan or what is a denarii? Uh, what, is, what does a priest do or a Levite do? But some of those questions might be better asked um, as we think about them with another person, with our parents, with uh, someone we know from church in a Sunday school class, uh, with a pastor or an elder. Um, those kinds of things. So, a very simple way to do Bible study. Let us pray together. God, thank you for the stories of Scripture. Thank you for the, the ways that your Spirit moves in the words of Scripture to, um, to make them your word. A word to us today. Thank you for the tug on our hearts to open the Bible and to read those stories and to, to, to know that it's okay to ask questions, even hard questions like, why does it say that? To acknowledge when it is inspiring to us and when it's uncomfortable. And thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ with whom we can have those conversations, with whom we can ask questions together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was early in my ministry, uh, one of the parishioners of a church in which I was serving had a stroke. And the stroke uh, terribly affected her speech. And so she was going through a very long process of speech rehabilitation. She often could not form the words that she wanted to say. So the people around her could not understand her. She was working very hard and making some progress, but the progress was very slow. And so sometimes when I would visit her, she would be trying to say something to me and I just could not understand what she was saying. And she would try again and again and finally she would just seem so exasperated. And I once asked her, do you just want me just to pray with you? And she nodded yes. And so I said to her, I'm going to pray for you to continue to be able to form your words. I'm going to pray for your speech, but I'm also going to pray for my ears to be able to hear a little better. With that in mind, let us now turn to God in prayer, praying for the word of God to be clear and our ears to be open. Let us pray. Holy God, as your spirit speaks to us. May the words of the scriptures read and the words of the sermon proclaimed be clear and articulate your word. And may our ears be open to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Roman Christians from chapter 7, verses 15 through uh, the first part of verse 25. Let us listen for a word from God. Paul writes, I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that, that, that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. 
For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I knew this was coming. Uh, this story that I'm about to tell, I knew I was going to have to tell it in this series of sermons on lessons I learned in elementary school. I, I tried to recall a lot of other lessons that I could, could preach about in this brief series. I reasoned that I've already shared this story with you once in a sermon a couple of years ago. I even rationalized that I didn't need to use the sermon as my own personal therapy session by telling this story again, but I knew that if I'm preaching a sermon on the lessons I've learned in elementary school, I was probably going to have to tell this story because it's one of the more memorable lessons I learned. I was in the fifth grade, and it was the day before Christmas break. And as we often did, we were having a party that day, and lots of times kids would bring gifts to exchange with their friends. And I was doing that that year. My mother had given me some money. I'd gone to Carl's Groceries, and I'd bought... Uh, little packs of football trading cards and and she'd help me wrap them up and I'd put the names of my my friends on those trading cards and I'd take them to school that day and I was very excited to share these with my friends and then in the midst of doing it I looked over and saw the look on John's face John, that was his name. Really, it was his name. John, his last name was Doe, as I recall. John Doe. I'm sure you believe that. But I'll never forget the look on his face when we both realized that I was not giving him a gift. I had not remembered him when making my list of friends. Now, over the years, I've tried to rationalize. Everybody makes mistakes, you know. Uh, he was a quiet kid, and so maybe it was just easy to kind of look past him. I, I don't know. I, I was a kid. I mean, it wasn't intentional, right? There's so many ways we rationalize, but none of that takes away the memory of the look on his face when we both realized I didn't have a gift for him. And, and the worst thing of all, you know, I don't remember all the details, but the worst thing of all, I don't think I apologized. The worst thing of all is, I think I was just so ashamed, I tried to pretend that this wasn't happening. I don't think I even apologized to him. There are hurts that, um, hurts that hurt us, things that people do to us to injure us. That's one kind of, of hurt. It requires a particular kind of healing. The hurts that other people do to us lead to our prayers for, for God to mend us emotionally, psychologically, physically, spiritually. Those hurts that people do to us. And then there are the hurts with which we hurt other people. The things we do to injure others. Whether we mean to or not is really kind of beside the point. There are things we do that hurt other people. That's another kind of hurt altogether. It requires a different kind of healing. It leads to prayers to be forgiven, prayers for forgiveness. And it leads to the, the struggle to try to figure out how do, we, how do we then reconcile the relationship? How do we come back together in relationship with people that we have hurt? This is the kind of hurt, uh, the kind of hurt with which we hurt others. This is the kind of hurt that, that throws up a bright, shiny, clear as day mirror right in front of our faces. A mirror 
into which we look and cannot deny how ugly we can sometimes be. The hurt with which we hurt other, pe other people. This is the kind of hurt that perhaps Paul had in mind when he was so brutally honest about his own sin, his own brokenness in that passage we just read from Romans chapter 7. Wretched man that I am, Paul concludes. Listen again to some of the things he says about himself, his own sin. I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want to do, but the very thing I hate, that's what I do. I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right. This is right. I know this is right. This is what I'm going to do. I can will it, but I cannot do it. I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want, that's what I end up doing, says Paul. Wretched man that I am. Paul makes this statement about himself, about his own sin, in the middle of a fairly sophisticated theological uh, conversation that he is having about um, the, the power of sin, uh, the role of the law in our relationship to sin, and the problematic nature of the law in our relationship to sin, and grace, which is the only thing that can save us. And so in this sort of sophisticated argument about sin and law and grace, Paul inserts this, um, this image, this illustration of his own brokenness. Now, this is not um, this is not the context of worship in which Paul is making this confession. He's not writing a psalm of personal penitence. This is not a personal devotion in which he's laying his soul bare before God about his brokenness. No, in this discourse in the seventh chapter of Romans, uh, Paul is simply being very honest, making an honest assessment about who he is, his own sinfulness, and he's using that as an example in the larger conversation about sin and law and grace. But even, even though it's just an example in a larger theological complex argument, by itself it is a powerful statement about who Paul is as a broken human being. He simply wants to acknowledge and illustrate the power that sin has over his life. And not even really just his life, obviously, but our lives, all of our lives. Paul knows who he is. He knows who we are as human beings. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Who will rescue me? And he answers that question with a very succinct statement of faith. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is only Christ who can rescue us from this wretched state of the power of sin in our lives. Only Christ. Christ is our only hope. Christ and Christ's grace. Now, here's the thing. Uh, being saved from this body of death, as, as Paul talks about it, this body of death, being saved, being rescued from this body of death, as Paul refers to the power of sin in our lives, uh, it's, it's about a lot more than just us being relieved that we can be forgiven for the, the broken things we do. It's about a lot more than us just saying, whew, I'm glad I don't have to pay for that sin. No, it doesn't just involve God forgiving us and us feeling better. It's about it's about a lot more than that. When we take Paul's acknowledgement of the power of sin in our lives, this is one ingredient, and we add to that the ingredient of the biblical promise that we have forgiveness from God. When we have those things, we don't have a complete res recipe for salvation and being rescued from this body of death until we add at least one more ingredient. It's not just about acknowledging our sin. It's not just about God forgiving us for that sin. It's about us reconciling with one another. 
about the, the mending of the relationship when someone has been sinned against, when someone has been hurt. You see, only then is the salvation complete. Just think about some of the ways Jesus talks about sin and forgiveness. Some of the things Jesus says to us in the Gospels. Remember when Jesus was asked, how do we pray? One of, the, one of the primary parts of the Lord's Prayer is, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, it doesn't say, Lord, forgive us, and then, you know, once we're safe, maybe we'll go out and forgive somebody else. No, forgive us our debts as we are forgiving our debtors. The two cannot be, cannot be separated. In Matthew's Gospel, later on, Jesus says, if you're going to worship and all of a sudden you remember, oh, you know what? Someone has something against me. I have sinned against someone, a brother or sister. Jesus says, stop what you're doing. Turn around. Go and be reconciled in that relationship and then come to worship. Later in the same chapter, Jesus says, if someone has sinned against you, you take the responsibility to go to that person and try to mend that relationship. If that doesn't work, take somebody else, another brother or sister with you. If that doesn't work, take it before the whole church. Jesus gives a, a sort of a, a laundry list of ways we go about, a process list for reconciling relationship. Forgiveness and reconciliation was very important to Jesus. I, I tell you what, if you, if you want to know just how important forgiveness and reconciliation is to Jesus, take some time this afternoon Tomorrow, sometime this week, just, just a few minutes to sit down with your Bible and just read chapter 18 in Matthew's Gospel. Just one chapter. Read one chapter. And you'll know how important forgiveness and reconciliation is to Jesus, just how seriously he took it. Now, back to the fifth grade. I've held on to my regret about that first, about that fifth grade gift exchange for a long time. I don't think obviously about it every day, but but often as a pastor doing Bible studies and preaching sermons on forgiveness and the way we hurt each other and reconciliation and all that, once in a while I, I think about that over the years. That that look on John's face when he and I both realized I didn't have a gift for him. But in a very real way, that's kind of safe for me, isn't it? I mean, to, to spend all my time thinking about the fifth grade, because that was a long time ago. I don't have a relationship with John right now. I, I don't, there's not a lot of work for me to do to reconcile that sin, is there? I can regret it. It can hurt my heart still, but I, it's kind of safe because I don't have a lot of work to do. And if I did come into contact with him again, it's that there's no mystery about what needs to be done, right? There's no mystery about what ought to happen. Hey, you remember fifth grade, man, I, I felt so bad that day. I'm so sorry about that. The next step's pretty simple. There's nothing, it's kind of a safe thing for me to think about when I think about my sin and my brokenness. Now, on the other hand, the more current events in my life the more current ways that I have sinned against others, against people around me, those things are not quite so safe to think about, are they? The ways that I continue to, um, to be a broken person. The more current events in my life take a little more work. That's another game altogether. You see, if I'm going to deal with the wretched man that I am today with the sin and brokenness in my life today, it means I'm going to have to do some real serious and intentional self-reflection. I'm going to have to look inward and ask, honestly, what is the brokenness in my life? What is the, the good that I want to do but I don't do? What is the, the evil that I don't want to do that I end up doing anyway? How do I hurt people around me? And then I'm going to have to admit some things about my life that I, and myself that I really would rather not admit. It's a lot easier not to admit those kinds of things. And then, and then if I'm really serious about this reconciliation thing, I'm going to have to have some difficult conversations, some uncomfortable conversations, uncomfortable for me, but also for the people with whom I have to talk. 
And you know, it's going to mean I make myself vulnerable because that person with whom I'm trying to reconcile, they get to make a choice too. They can choose to forgive me, but they don't have to. They don't have to offer forgiveness. And worst of all, if I take this seriously, this forgiveness thing, this reconciliation thing that Jesus seems to take so seriously, worst of all, it means I've got to do the incredibly difficult work of changing my behavior, of changing who I am. Is that even possible? I mean, remember what Paul said the good I want to do, I can't do. I can will what is right. I can know this is right. I'm going to do it. This is it. And I don't do it. I can know what's wrong. Don't do it. And I end up doing that. Is it even possible for me to change my behavior? Is reconciliation even possible? Is all this hard work Will it make any difference? Can I even do it? Wretched man that I am. Who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, this is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Wherever we are, you are present with us. We are united in Christ and the Spirit intercedes for us. There's nowhere we can flee from God's Spirit. Nothing that we cannot speak to you, our Creator. And so in this time and place, we share the hopes of our hearts. We share the questions on our minds and the worries that keep us up at night. We pray to the Lord our God who is like no other. The first and the last, the beginning and the end the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Lord, from whom we cannot flee, we ask you for wisdom in the face of ever-growing uncertainties. We remember those in our midst and those known only to you who are consumed with fear. Fear not only for their livelihoods, but for their very lives. Grant us the resolve to do whatever is required for everyone to have enough to eat for everyone to have a safe place to live, for the ability to get the care they need and an education that values individuals and creates a society of people of character. Do not let our imagination fall short of your ability to make all things possible. Loving God who searches and know, knows us, reveal to us those places in our hearts that need to be broken so that we might go to the places in the world that break your heart. Do not let us turn away from the people who need to know they are not alone. Ease the loneliness of those unable to see their families and those without family. Expand the household of faith to include all those on the margins of our society, the imprisoned and the impoverished, those who have been neglected and those who are seeking asylum and safety. Do not let us reject those whom Jesus came to save. Generous God, who overwhelms us with goodness and mercy, we thank you for waking us up this day, for giving us the gift of this life, for calling us to be your people. When we are tempted to judge others harshly, remind us to forgive as we have been forgiven. When we feel paralyzed with doubt, 
or a wash in anxiety, grant us the peace that passes understanding. When we do not know what to do or where to turn, make your word a light unto our path so that we can take one step closer to Christ as he leads us in the way everlasting. We make this prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we leave this place of worship, wherever we are today, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, his son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and with all those you love, wherever they may be, this day and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.